This episode is brought to you by Next Level Gaming, located in Salem, Oregon. Take your gaming experience to the next level with their stellar inventory of Magic the Gathering singles, Warhammer 40k miniatures, and overall great customer service. Next Level Gaming. Take your gaming to the next level. Here. And this is Jeff. Welcome on in to another episode of the Triad Academy podcast, where it's always better, better to get, get good rather than get, get wrecked. And this episode's a special one because it involves a deck tech from our executive officer, Cole, here. After all, you're here because you want the best information available on all archetypes and playstyles, and we here at the Academy recognize that. This deck tech, tech today we'll be doing will involve the introduction of another archetype not fully talked about, which is stacks. And before we go any farther, yes, Jeff over here, my co-host, has a very certain love-hate relationship with stacks. Yeah, don't remind me. It's kind of like being strapped to a chair, having your eyes stapled open, and being forced to watch a repeating loop of Roseanne Barr singing the national anthem. For 12 hours straight? Yeah. That sounds almost fun. For you. What the hell? <laughs> No! It's kind of like a cross between power leveling and Diablo 3 and sitting in line at the DMV. <laughs> what is your problem? <laughs> are you trying to sit there and play a game of no magic? Oh, wait, well, you actually kind of are. You kind of are. Oh, damn it. So, what is Stacks here? And why is this deck for the attack we're doing? Well, let's get into Roark Thar Stacks, a competitive EDH version of telling the table to calmly put its head between its legs and kiss its collective rear ends goodbye. Stacks as an acronym is short for the $4,000 deck solution, as it used to be known. Now, if you're interested in reading in more detail about the descriptive history of it and how it got its name, we'll include certain links at the end of this video and this podcast article where you can go ahead and take a look at the history of this resource denial oriented strategy now the premise behind stacks is to force the table to include yourself to sacrifice tap and tax your resources while you the stacks player continue to play through certain ex uh, accessory pieces that allow you to either soften the blow against your own pieces or in some cases allow you to bypass those pieces altogether now, in its rawest form, this is all about control through attrition, and that attrition comes at a painful cost. Hence the analogy made before. Yeah, don't remind me. <laughs> Part of what makes a stack deck effective can be found in which how the stack itself deck is built. Which is, with the stack pieces given in mind, in order to walk around your own restrictions. And this is where Rorik Thar comes in. This is my boomstick! Rorik Thar is a 6-drop, six 6-6 six, six commander with Vigilance and Reach. States whenever he must attack during each combat if able, and the most important part, whenever a player casts a non-creature spell, Rorik Thar deals 6 damage to, to that, that player. player. Yeah, no, universally that is a painful, painful thing to deal with. It's not saying that you can't play the stuff, it's just saying pay your taxes. Yeah, and not just, not a good way either. That's No, <laughs> that's like saying pay your taxes with interest. Oh, by the way, you haven't paid your taxes yet, but we're going to make the due date for your taxes today just because we can. Yeah, and by the way, this is not taxing a resource that you don't worry about half the time. This is taxing a resource called your life total. Yeah, taxing your life total is never a fun thing, especially if you're playing any sort of a... Uh, ad nauseum variant deck. Or even Doomsday for that matter. In some ways, yeah, depending on uh, what you're usually using to go find. And more often than not, if you're using any sort of a Doomsday pile that involves Laboratory Maniac, you're often trying to play with cheaper free non-creature spells. So yeah, that's going to really, really hit you. Yeah. But, after all, this deck sees to maximize accessing it through not only through eliminating the number of creature non-creature based spells, but maximizing the number of creatures in this list. Yeah, people, we're playing creatures in CDH. Not just a handful, a lot of them. Yeah, this is no ordinary uh, convenience smart, is it? 
this, this is S Mart. <laughs> so S Mart is a CDH one-stop shop that would make Ash Williams weep tears of joy at the overabundance of bargain price tools. And these tools are the kind of tools that which are sure to make your enemy squirm faster than you can say Tlatu Ferrata Nictu. Speaking of tools, let's get to them. Good answer. <laughs> so as with any blue collar job, there are certain tools of the trade that you have to master in order to get good at your profession. In this case, it's our stacks pieces. And more importantly, sequencing your place so that way you can walk around them. In this case, in my deck particularly, I have over 16 pieces. Mm -hmm. Not counting the general, of course. Who in, their own, who in themselves are a barrier in playing unfair magic? In specific, some of these pieces are such as Melrod, Possibility Storm, Stranglehold, Trianosphere, Manglehorn, Orb of Dreams, Blood Moon, Lodestone Golem, Thorn of Anethyst, Correction Revoker, Magus of the Moon, Scavenging Nose, Harsh Mentor, Graft Digger's Cage, Root Maze, and Urabrasta Hidden. You know, the common theme that these pieces each have is that they individually cause problems for your opponents by making life harder for them. Null Rod is a great example of this because many of the fast combo decks out there use artifact mana to propel them forward. Guess what Null Rod does? Absolutely, Absolutely nothing. nothing. No, seriously, read the flavor text on the card. <laughs> and actually, that's going to be what your opponents are going to be doing after they drop this on the table. That's because Null Rod shuts off all activated abilities of all artifacts. It's literally the original artifact version of Stony Silence. This includes artifact lands as well. So, why are you not affected? It's because most of this deck's ramp involves mana dorks. Which brings us to another oh, form of hate, hate, which is land hate. CDH is a playground of expensive dual lands. After yeah, they all. are. Taiga and oh, oh. <laughs> Taiga, Badlands, Underground Sea. Underground Sea, if I remember correctly, is broken over the thousand dollar point. I don't know if it's gotten that high, but it's gotten pretty high. Yeah, up. it's almost no. a small. It's almost the price of a small car. Yeah, no. So we don't have to worry about this, considering we run cards such as Blood Moon and Magus of the Moon, which are like, hey, buddy, are you explaining expensive lands over there? No, you're not. <laughs> nice mountain, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. A lot of the land base here is uh, geared towards green to include the dual lands. And if anything, having cards like that won't hurt you so much as it actually kind of helps you fix your mana base along the way in the process. It actually does. Believe it or not, it actually fixes up for one of our win cons, actually, who actually has one of the most ridiculous costs to cast. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> Uh, but let's say worse comes to worse, okay? And things are looking grim for the home team. What do we do here? We can just blow up everything with Obliterate and Jackal Hops and start over. But even better, let's say we want to make a blue player rage quit. How do we do that? Cycle Decree of Annihilation in response to them playing a Pact of Negation. Yeah. And by the way, just to let you know, this could usually be done by usually turn 5 or turn 6. Yeah. Moving on to some of the other stacks pieces, notwithstanding that which is nasty in and of itself. Thorn of Amethyst taxes all non-creature spells, which this deck doesn't usually care about. Manglehorn punishes your opponents for playing artifacts. Stranglehold shuts off tutoring for your opponents and extra turns. Take that, Edric. And Lodestone Golem taxes all non-artifact spells, which this, pro which this deck has no problem paying for. Yeah. Not to mention, we also have Scavenging News, Urobras to Hidden, and Harsh Mentor. Yep. And, which deserve their own mention as these cards act as stacks pieces as well as because of their contribution to your deck's overall game plan of slowing your opponents down. Scoozy eats reanimation targets in yards, and Urobras just shuts off creature based infinite combos. By the way, he also gives your board a haste boost. Sometimes actually quite relevant. But not to mention, let's talk about Harsh Mentor. This little guy is quite the unsung hero, as it hits abilities from artifacts and creatures and lands that are not mana abilities. Suck it, fetch lands. After all, that shuts off a lot of infinite combos. Yeah, it does. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, and finally, let's get to the other three pieces you did not mention yet. Yep. Root Maze, Trinosphere, and Orb of Dreams. 
These three cards provide early game lockdown by forcing people like me who like to play Unfair Magic to wait their turn like good little boys and girls. I know. I hear having your stuff into the battlefield is quite irritating. Yeah, it is. Screw that. <laughs> I'm trying to blow up the world and go home. And and the three ball always loves people. Three ball. Burn it with fire. <laughs> Burn Trinisphere with fire. Burn all the copies. <laughs> but one of the big problems is people would say about the architect like this. How do we win? You know, one of the biggest complaints that we've heard here at the Academy is that stacks isn't exactly all that viable because really all that we end up doing is punching people in the face like a bunch of potato magic noobs. Luckily, however, we've managed to fix that issue. Welcome to your win cons. Yeah, starting everything on, Shaman of the Forgotten Ways is, for those who've forgotten about, it has biorhythm as an ability. Yeah, when I saw that card get spoiled back in the cons block, actually, I believe it was Dragons, Dragons of Tarkir. Thank yep. you. Uh, the first words that came to my mind when I saw that card was biorhythm on a stick. Are you nuts? Biorhythm is banned. Yeah, biorhythm with legs, baby. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, the massive creature count that you have in this deck, I believe you're running somewhere in the neighborhood of about 34, 35 creatures. 35 creatures. Yeah, counting the general. Yeah, I, no, that lets you walk around that issue with no problem and whatsoever. by the way, all you gotta have is your general out on the field, and you immediately have the trigger able to inactivate. Yep, you have the requirements already met. You're totally right. And Kiki Conscripts in and of itself, we don't have to say too much about no. that because, I mean, both of these five mana creatures easily spell doom for opponents that can't bounce your board at instant speed. Here's another card I always like to play with, and I run this one. Grafted Exoskeleton here. Grafted Exoskeleton is a really, really underplayed and very nasty card. You know, the quickest way to a man's heart is usually with Chuck Norris's fist. But the quickest way in this kind of a situation with game concessions is to drop Grafted Exoskeleton onto Rurikdar. You know, normally beanbag rounds from a shotgun normally hurt like hell, but this turns those beanbag rounds into depleted uranium shells. Yeah. Cast two spells, people. Cast two non drinker spells. Let's end this game. Right. It, it turns your, what, five, six, seven turn clock, if you're just at 40 life, usually. Yeah. Into what? Two shots in your toast? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty One nasty. shot and you're locked out. Yeah, one shot, you're locked. Right. Yeah. So, remember those land destruction spells of ours? There's a creature in here that I want to touch on briefly. Uh, Titania Protector of Argoth. Yeah. You know, that creature in and of itself is a really beautiful creature and very much slept on card. So, it's kind of hard for your opponents to fight back. Uh, post board wipe because with titania on the field if you drop a mass land destruction spell you get an army of five three elementals uh literally at your beck and call ready to comp convert your opponents to jehovah's witnesses or if they don't want to convert over they would look like you uh was it <laughs> cm punk during the mike jackson uh ufc fight oh yeah during uh ufc 225 yeah yeah that was nasty <laughs> Yeah, kids, go do your homework on that. Go watch that fight between CM Punk and Mike Jackson if you haven't. That was one of the, that was a good butt whooping. <laughs> yeah, it was. Now, of course, that's not all that this deck has in store. We're going to be posting Cole's deck list so you can see some of the other shenanigans that he has in, uh, in store for you. So, naturally, there are a few things, though, that will mitigate uh, the damage that we're going to be taking from this kind of a general. Basilisk Collar is obviously one such way, as it grants you lifelink. Yep. By the way, just to let you know, Basky, Basilisk Collar is just a really great card in a deck like this. Not to mention, are we doing all these damages? It can even turn Inferno Titan into a literally every turn, start pinging, start just shooting away opponent's creatures. You're not wrong about that. It turns uh, Inferno Titan into a, into a machine gun. Yeah. <laughs> It really does. You know, with that on board and having it equipped to either one of those creatures, realistically, worked Dar above all else. I mean, it means your non-creature spells do nothing for you. Like, yep. They mean nothing to you. Now, as for cards like Blood Moon and Magus of the Moon, or for times where we have no access to lands, for whatever the reason is, we also have 19 different sources of mana ramp most of which are green in nature, to include Carpet of Flowers. Yeah, now this card, I'm going to say right now, 
this is a type of deck that, unlike most other decks, we expect to play with Blood Moon. All right? And most decks, you can see a plenty of gameplay in CDH matches, and you can see people just losing game because of one because of Blood Moon. Yeah, no, I remember one particular game where you were playing against a... Uh, I'd like to say it was a Send Triplets deck that tried to be competitive. Yeah. And I remember how quickly you locked that person <laughs> out on turn two using Magus of the Moon. Yeah. No, it was actually Blood Moon that you yeah, used. It was... Yeah, I used Blood Moon. But yeah, no. But this guy literally sat the rest of the game fumigating because he literally couldn't do anything else. His entire mana base, except three lands in his entire deck. We're all non basics. Yeah. Like, really? <laughs> How did you not plan for that? <laughs> exactly. But not to mention, Carpet of Flowers is another great card. In fact, this card is actually kind of like a, almost in a secret way, a stacks card. Yep. Because most blue players, unless they see a Carpet of Flowers at the board, a lot of them get deterred of playing... Islands. Yeah, islands. Even their dual land islands. Yeah. They don't, yeah. they get deterred from playing them and it's like... Go ahead, set yourself back on mana intentionally. Yeah, no, you want to see a blue player score and drop Carpet of Flowers turn one and watch what happens when you use that Carpet of Flowers just buy you back all of that mana. Yeah, and to support this further strat with Blood Moon, we also run 11 basic forest. And, to, fi and 5 basic mountains, sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, oh, don't worry about it. To actually set up our basic mana base. In fact, those 11 basic forests, we typically want one or two of those per game. Anyway, not to mention, like any CDH deck, though, we do run a plethora of non-basic lands. In this case, 19. But not to mention, though, if you look at some of these lands, you might realize, though, that some of these lands that do not generate any color or mana, particularly, are there for the pure utility value. Not to mention, scavenger grounds for exiling graveyards on the stack. Yeah, that's pretty nasty. Winding Canyons for instant speed creatures. Seems good. And there's a couple others in there. I hear you even have a strip mine in yours, don't you? Yeah, I do. I actually found, I actually found one of the, uh, uh, from the vault ones on the cheap. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really pretty art, too. Exactly. Combined together with all the mana rocks and mana dorks and such, and one lands, it's 50 Four sources of mana production between the mana dorks and the lands. Yeah, that's over half of the deck. I mean, basically says one out of every two cards is going to be a mana source or a land. Yep. So, I mean, you're pretty much sitting pretty no matter how you look at it. Yep. But yeah. I will admit to it, this deck is not without its weaknesses, and yeah. this deck is no exception. <laughs> yeah, you know, in specific creature-based matchups where creature-oriented combos are the path to victory, along with extremely fast combo decks like... Uh, 4C Breakfast Hulk, Shimmerzer, Sadisi Ad Nauseam Fishbowl, which has a, about a 60 40 matchup against uh, Rurikthar stacks. Yeah. Can't cause problems uh, for the deck to keep up, especially with a fast start. Yeah. So the reason why is because this deck is a stacks combo hybrid, which is pretty much the standard for competitive commander. The role of stacks is normally to act as a roadblock for your faster opponents while you make your way to your infinite combo or your combo lockout win conditions. Unlike some of our other opponents, we have no access to blue or black, which are unmatched when it comes to direct tutoring. And as such, we have to draw cards the old-fashioned way for the most part. Yep. But while we do have to draw cards the old-fashioned way, it doesn't mean, though, we don't have access to tutors. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, most of our tutors, in fact, We'll dig up creature cards for all that matter. Sure. All right? But two cards in particular we want to make a mention of, though, nonetheless. Sylvan Library and Survival of the Fittest, which are, in their own ways, some of the most awesome sources of card selection ever to be created in Magic's history. I agree. In fact, Survival of the Fittest is downright broken in many aspects. <laughs> in some cases, yeah. No, that card is over $100 for very, very good reason. Yeah. Uh, you can use any one of your creatures in hand to go ahead and pitch it. Uh, to go find whatever you need, especially post-mass land destruction. Uh, here's a great example. Uh, and this is, of course, just coming from a casual game. I had uh, a Survival of the Fittest in another green variant deck that I was using a long time ago. And Cole happened to be in this game. Uh, in this game, he decided to drop an Apocalypse. Turn 4, I believe it was? Yeah, this was when I was playing with my Kazul Snowy Prison deck. Way, way, way back in the days. Yeah. Right? 
So, Cole drops Apocalypse turn four against an Aloro player who had this amazing fast start. And, of course, I have survival on the field. So, what's the first thing that I go do? Well, I go pitch a creature and I go find Birds of Paradise with a green source in hand. Yeah. From there, you proceed to win the game. Yeah. <laughs> that Aloro player was salty as hell. <laughs> Come on now, when you had a board state like that, would you be salty? Uh, I'd feel a little stupid for playing into it. <laughs> I don't know about salty. <laughs> It'd be more like, uh, well, crap, this happened. Yeah, in fact, actually, it was a funny remark, later on down the line after I had this deck cooperation for a while and showing off some victories and doing mm -hmm. pretty good actually at some major tournaments actually. You start playing this deck after I convinced you to. Yeah, you know, as a result of GP Vegas and seeing how the deck ran, uh, you managed to finally convince me to actually give the archetype a shot. I know this is coming from me. This is very surprising because I normally have a love-hate relationship with stacks. And I, you are pretty sound in your methods. Yeah, I, you know, I, I have a healthy respect for it, but I'm not a fan of it. But after building this archetype and piloting it in other LGSs, playing it live and whatnot, I've learned to uh, garner a certain healthy respect for it. Uh, and in my list, which we will also provide, uh, my list is similar to Cole's, but it has a stronger emphasis towards the Splinter Twin combo, and it also includes a creature-based Splinter Twin conga line starting with Imperial Recruiter. What that means is starting from Imperial Recruiter, you can chain creatures from Imperial Recruiter all the way into a particular creature that will allow you to combo off and win. As an added bonus, I've also included a Planeswalker package that complements the Mass Land Destruction Suite that is in that deck. And boy, are they good. In fact, among others, they are Domri Chaos Bringer, Xenagos... And Chandra, Torch of Defiance. Yeah, no, on those three Planeswalkers, I will say right now, those Planeswalkers do a lot of work after yeah. post-board wipe. Yeah, they do. So, Xenagos the Reveler, Chandra, Torch of Defiance, and Domri, Chaos Bringer have a special thing in common. They all add mana to your pool as a part of their plus ability. That means any sort of cards that you end up drawing as a result of activating those Planeswalkers will allow you to generate any sort of value. Yeah. Not to mention that Zendigos' ultimate will almost sometimes flat out get you so far ahead that you will be untouchable. Exactly. And that's exactly the reason why I run that son of a gun. Chandra's ultimate will just pretty much, pretty much say, hey... I cast a bunch of spells, and you guys automatically lose the game. Yeah, lava axes to the face are always a wonderful thing, right? <laughs> free lava axes. Free lava axes. That axes can't be countered. That. And you know, speaking of free stuff, Domri Chaos Bringer. Free 16 power every turn cycle? Yeah. Seems legit. <laughs> Seems very legit. At the beginning of each player's end step, you create a 4-4 beast token with Trample. That is very, very strong right there. That will close out a game very quickly. I thought I wish they made it boars. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's just more towards the suiting, but hey. That's true. Now, stacks as an archetype is not easy to master. It requires specific timing of your stacks pieces as well as access to your support pieces in order to walk around your own stacks pieces. The key to winning stacks is to force your opponents to fight through your own maze while you use your support pieces as skeleton keys to cheat through your own maze. Which brings up the question to be... Of the general, Rai Roar Thar. The short answer is, is that his abilities lead him to be a very powerful punisher, both inside and outside of combat. And since Stax is all about attrition through resource denial, what better resource to deny than someone's life total? Yeah, you know, attrition wars are never easy to fight, but with enough experience and tuning, you too can master the challenging path that is Stax. Now, that's all the time that we have for this episode of the Triart Academy. We will be posting the full deck list for myself and for Cole via Tapped Out in the references section below, so that way you can go ahead and see the decks uh, in full detail. And if you like this content and you would like to see more of it, feel free to like, share, and subscribe with uh, your fellow friends, and share this podcast with your friends as well. And as always, shop smart. Shop smart.